On January 14, 1968, the Orange Bowl found itself hosting the Super Bowl for the first time. Tickets were $12 for the first game, and then they went to 15 And I think this last year, the tickets were, uh, what, five or 600 I don't, I don't know exactly, but uh, uh, my dad at that time did the halftime show at the Super Bowl, and he did a pregame, and so all these events were part of his activities when he did, because he was one of these creative geniuses. The Green Bay Packers marched onto the field against the Oakland Raiders. Green Bay quarterback Bart Starr and Lombardi led their team to a 33-14 win over the Raiders. Once again, the Orange Bowl had the national spotlight, and Miami's amazing winter weather delivered the goods. So much so that the following year, the Orange Bowl was once again ground zero for the Super Bowl. I was there then, uh, and it was Baltimore and the Jets, and that was memorable because uh, the New York Jets upset uh, the Colts, um, and in, in doing so, you know, it really gave the AFL teams a parity with the NFL teams. On January 12th, 1969, the New York Jets and the Baltimore Colts squared off for what would be the most prominent Super Bowl in the history of this great game. With great bluster, New York's quarterback, Joe Namath, announced they would beat the Colts. The Colts head coach, Don Shula, dismissed Namath's bravado. When I was coaching the Colts, and uh, we played a team from uh, New York, yeah, the Jets, I keep for, forgetting who that was, and they had a quarterback by the name of Joe Willie Namath, and uh, we were 17 point favorites in the Super Bowl, and he predicted the night before the game that uh, they were gonna win the game. And everybody thought he was crazy, and I had that prediction pasted up on our bulletin board for the pregame speech, and uh, they won the game. And my relationship with our owner was never quite the same after that. I lasted another year in Baltimore, but then the next year I moved to Miami. A lasting memory I have of the Orange Bowl Stadium itself is Joe Namath coming out and pointing that finger and then walking off uh, with his hands straight up in the air, uh, a winner, uh, beating all odds, and that sticks with me. The love affair between the Super Bowl and the Orange Bowl was once again in play on January 17, 1971. This time, the Orange Bowl greeted the Dallas Cowboys and the Baltimore Colts for their supreme battle. It was the first Super Bowl ever played on artificial turf. I remember that they, they changed the turf to artificial turf. And when I first got on it, I, I felt like super fast. And I said, well, this is great. And then I started thinking, I said, well, that's great, but what do the fast guys feel like, you know? So, uh, and it was difficult. It, it was hard because uh, the heat, the heat reflected off the artificial turf. And, uh, you know, there were times that uh, it was temperature was 130. Um, degrees on the field. The Colts took the championship with a dramatic 16-13 win. While Super Bowl fever caused dancing in the Orange Bowl, the Dolphins were building into a formidable force. We were an expansion team. Uh, my first year I think we won three games, the next year we won four. Then things changed. We um, drafted a pretty good tight end from Michigan, Jim Manage. Uh, they uh, acquired Nick Bonacani. We got a pretty good wide receiver from Cleveland, Paul Warfield. and. Uh, we got a guy to put it all together, Don Shula, so uh, it was a special time and certainly the Orange Bowl was very instrumental in having that special time. I had been drafted by the, by the Dolphins in uh, 1970. I was their first pick and uh, it took a while to get to the Orange Bowl. Training camp in those days lasted about six weeks. But uh, we went in there for a preseason game and preseason games at that time were viewed differently than they are today. It was a big event. And it had to do with the new sheriff in town, Don Shula. So my first experience was for a preseason game, uh, went into that magnificent building, and for a meaningless game, there were 80,000 people in the stands. It was rocking and I never knew the Orange Bowl any other way. You know, coming to Miami in 1970 and, and having the, uh, the Orange Bowl as our, as our home stadium, I've got a lot of great memories uh, of the Orange Bowl. Uh, you know, the perfect season, 72 season, and all the games that were played in, in the Orange Bowl, and a fantastic uh, fan support that we had. 
the fans seemed that they were right on top of the field and uh, and they gave us that great crowd noise and it was a tremendous uh, home field advantage when we played in the Orange Bowl. We hardly ever lost there. Uh, obviously it's because of Don Shula and, and the fact that we were an incredible team. But it's also uh, that 12th man that they talk about. It's a steel stadium and when people get to stomp on their feet in that stadium, it was hugely loud and there's no track around the stadium. So a lot of baseball fields and you know, the track where you're far away. And it was also the, the seats were slanted quickly. So all 80,000 people were virtually right on top of the field. And, uh, and that really, really is an advantage for the home team. The people stomped on the uh, metal of the Orange Bowl and uh, you know, made a lot of noise. And, and when you're playing, you really try to stay focused and, and the no noise is really a blur. But when they started stomping and yelling, uh, you, you'd really feel it uh, as a uh, home player. I knew that when a visiting team came in or players that I knew from other teams that I went to college with or knew, I always felt like they didn't really believe they could win at the Orange Bowl. It was loud, it was hot, it was muggy, and it was mine. And I just knew it was going to give me an advantage and give me an opportunity to win. I always felt like it was a good touchdown advantage for the Miami Dolphins because I knew and used to see guys, they changed their warm-ups. Oh, I'm not going to go out early and stretch because I don't want to sweat too much. And once guys start changing their routines, you got them. And I always felt that way with, uh, with my old boyfriend, the Orange Bowl. I always felt like we had a great chance to win. The Orange Bowl was, was just a wonderful place to play. I have two uh, games that I uh, distinctly remember and will, will the rest of my life. First game was the championship game against the Baltimore Colts in 1971. Um, I intercepted a ball on a tip ball from Curtis Johnson, our cornerback, and ran it back 63 yards for a touchdown, but the interesting part of that run, there were seven perfect blocks by our defensive players. They just went down like bowling pins. Um, Nick Bonacani said, Dick, you're running so slow that I went out and got a hot dog and came back. And I said, Nick, that was only because you're the only one that didn't make a block. And it put us in the Super Bowl against Dallas uh, uh, the next week. So it was really a special night to be able to uh, intercept the ball from Johnny Unitas in the Orange Bowl, score a touchdown, and get to the Super Bowl. We were happy to be in the Super Bowl that year in 1971. But our, our goal was to go get back to the Super Bowl and win it the next year. And uh, Week after week, we kept winning. We kept winning. We really didn't feel the pressure until I think we were 14 and 0 going into the playoffs because we knew we had to win all those games to uh, be champs. And uh, we did. We went all the way and became the only team at that time to go undefeated. And 35 years later, we're still the only undefeated team. Um, 1972, the perfect season, 17 and 0. Um, resonates not only locally but nationally. Uh, no team has received more recognition than that perfect season team. Uh, I don't care if you're in San Francisco or Boston or New York or Chicago. Um, if you say 17 and 0, perfect, people will say 1972 Miami Dolphins. With the popularity of the Dolphins team at its highest, Dolphins owner Joe Robbie began his campaign for a new stadium to replace the aging Orange Bowl. Years of wrangling left Robbie unconvinced of the city's sincerity, so he began looking for other alternatives. In 1976, Super Bowl fever was once again looking for the Miami Magic. The Orange Bowl greeted Super Bowl X in a matchup between the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Dallas Cowboys. On January 18, 1976, the Steelers beat Dallas 21-17. But this was not the last of the great games to visit the Orange Bowl. On January 21, 1979, the Orange Bowl would welcome an old friend one last time. And history would repeat itself once more as Pittsburgh defeated Dallas again 35-31 and the Steelers became the first team ever to win three Super Bowls. The Super Bowl never returned to the Orange Bowl after game 13. As the game got bigger and the, and the entertainment value got bigger, 
um, it, it became necessary to move it. So um, the next time they had a Super Bowl in Miami, I think there was a 10, more than a 10 year um, space uh, before the 89 Super Bowl that was held in Joe Robbie Stadium. The most memorable game that, uh, that I coached in, in the Orange Bowl had to be the 85 Bear game because it was just, uh, it, it had everything. It had that great fan support. It had a great uh, Chicago Bear football team that was undefeated at that time coming in here to play. It had all of our uh, uh, veteran players down on the sideline just uh, wanting to give the pregame speech. And uh, I didn't let them do that, but I, I wanted them to be on the sideline talking to our players about the importance of uh, winning this game so that we could be the only undefeated team. So that 72 team was down there pacing the sideline, led by Zonka and Manny Fernandez and Larry Little and Jim Kick. The Chicago Bears were down here and ironically were uh, undefeated and, and were beaten by uh, Miami Dolphins. I realized the, the impact that these people had in the Orange Bowl. I mean, I, I got goosebumps talking about it right now. And I, you know, being on the sidelines and, and, and listening to these fans cheer and, and support their team, it was just, it was just unbelievable. And, Again, while you're playing, you sometimes overlook that because you're, you're focusing and concentrating on the actual game and you don't really know the noise uh, elevation and, and what the impact is. But uh, you know, after sitting on the sidelines or standing on the sidelines in 1985, it, uh, it was just unbelievable. And I realized why they were so instrumental in, in our success. They were going to be undefeated. They were going undefeated. If we didn't beat them, they were going to go undefeated. It was a night, it was a special night for uh, the undefeated Miami Dolphins. Most of them from the 72 team were on the sideline. It was Monday night football, and uh, it became the Dan Marino show to, uh, to his three wide receivers, Nat Moore, Mark Clayton, and Mark Duper, and they made it a special night. The way that we played that first half, uh, we just, uh, Marino was unbelievable, and uh, uh, we just had all the answers for all of the a uh, variety of bear blitzes that they had. Uh, they were killing everybody with their blitzes, but you know, we got the ball off before they got there and Nat Moore had a big game and uh, he just uh, put a lot of points on the board and uh, it was just one of the best offensive performances I've ever been around. We, we hung on to win that game and it was a real special, one of the best games I've ever seen.